Thank you for joining us online today. Here at House of the Lord, we love to hear about what God is doing in the lives of his people. So if you have a testimony that you'd like to share with us, please email it to amen at hotl.church. If this house has impacted you in any way and you would love to partner with us financially, you can visit our website at hotl.church and click on the upper right to give, or you can text an amount to 84321. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the message and have a great day. This morning we have a, we have a, just a, an amazing friend of Robbie and I's for probably the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, we've known this couple, Pastor Don and Deb Metcalf. Um, it, it was kind of a, uh, probably one of the most um, unique things I've seen is God taking a, a, a young couple, young boy from the country and planting him right in the middle of Los Angeles, California, to plant a church uh, where he served for over 30, 35 years, built an amazing church down there. We've been down there a number of times. Um, he escaped from California and uh, is, now, is, is now in Kodak, Tennessee. But Pastor Don is probably one of the... the spiritual coaches and big brothers that I've had over the years. It's probably put more stuff into me that's helped shape how I lead, how I think, uh, even sometimes how I talk, some of the isms that, that you know, my staff loves to hear me. is like, well, it didn't come by me. I, I just hung around this guy a little bit too much. But I would love you to put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Pastors Don and Deb Metcalf. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. It's truly our pleasure to be here with you this morning. You know, God is in the house. And that's why when you come in, you feel at home. Because your father's here. And I just felt such at home when I walked in here this morning. And I just enjoyed the worship and the presence of God so much. And I just want to say we love your pastors so much. They're just awesome, and we thank you for your hospitality. And um, we always have and we always will love this precious pastor couple. that God has blessed you so much for you to have them over you. But uh, it's good to see all of you, our old friends, not in age, but yeah, in relationship. Old, don't, don't look old. <laughs> And those that we're just getting to meet and know, it's just so good um, to get to know you. And I just want to say one thing. Um, you, you have an awesome, beautiful country here. Amazing. Amazing country that God has Almost blessed you with. Almost as beautiful oh, as Tennessee. Almost. I thought Tennessee was in first place, but I think you guys are in first place. Yeah, we're yeah. second. Well, we have to... We have, have to, to be say honest. that, you know. We're, I have to be honest. We have to be diplomatic it's and tell you. It's just beautiful here. But I do want to pray over the word real yeah. fast. So, Father God, Lord, as we're in your living room, Thank Lord, you, and we just sit at your feet. We pray, Lord, that, that your heart would be just come forth from dawn to this morning, God, and that your heart would just touch our spirit. Lord, that we would hear it, that we would receive it, and, Lord, that we would work in it walk in it, Lord. And I just pray, God, Jesus. over this house, I pray, Lord, that you would bring increase, Lord, in, in all of our spirits uh, throughout this, the coming days, Lord, yes, that's Lord. ahead of us, yes. the work you've called us to, Lord. Bring increase in our spirit, Lord. Yes. Make us strong and mighty in your spirit and your word. Lord, I pray for increase in our health. Mm -hmm. Lord, from head to toe, that you would just it bring increase to every person, Lord, their children, yes. and our grandchildren, Father. And, Lord, I pray for our finances. Lord, bring yes. increase in our finances, yes, Lord, Lord, according to your will for our yes, lives. Lord. And, Lord, most of all, I see, pray, Lord, that you would take this increase that you're going to bring upon us, Lord, and put within us. And, Lord, that we will push it forward to build your kingdom, Lord. Your kingdom is what matters most in our lives, yes, Father. Souls, God, that you would bring to us and the mighty works and exploits yes. that our hands will do through your spirit, Lord. Yes. We just give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, babe. 
Yeah, you can, you, we, we get to take that back okay. to Tennessee. <laughs> De- hey, Deb, did you see my name was up there in the bright lights? Um, there it is. Behind every successful man is a surprise mother-in-law. Why don't you just turn to somebody and say, my, you're looking good. (laughs) Some of you had to lie right there, but we'll have an altar call. How many would agree that, uh, well, let's do it this way. Why don't you just turn to somebody and say, I like this place, man. I love the, how many love this place? It, you know, I, 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 this is amazing. I came up here a time or two before, and I think early on, Pastor Jeff, when you were here, this ain't nothing like what it started out to be many years ago. I, I, I'm impressed, you guys. I really am. I feel like I am at home right here. I do have a big problem, big problem. I'm used to giving people advice. That's what we do now that we're retired. I don't have any advice for this place, Pastor. Y'all got it. You're you're there, all right? You're there. Come on. How many know you got it? So we're going to preach on humility here now. (laughs) But I like this place, amen? I want to talk to you a little bit about this enterprise called the church. And I use the term enterprise uh, because how many know this is God's idea? We didn't create the church. This was God's idea. The church is God's idea. We need to know how. We need to know why. We need to understand the heart of God. But guys, what we're in, I don't know if you know this, but you did not stumble in here today. Now, y'all got to say amen. Amen. I I told them yesterday, if you don't say amen, my inferiorities kick in. I get all panicky. And when I get scared, I just, I don't know what to do. I go back to the beginning of the outline. I start all over again. (laughs) And we will be here till the rapture. (laughs) If I don't get some feedback, all right? We're going to start in the book of Numbers. But the church is God's idea. And it is an enterprise. And, uh... I want to tell you that, uh, you know, you know one, one of the things when you've been preaching 40 or 50 years, and, you know, nowadays we all have our outlines on our computer, and when you, when you go somewhere, you start, you know, clawing back through all those, oh, Lord, what do you want me to say? And I always ask two questions, what, do, what does the Lord want to say, and what do the people need? And my, my passion today, I hope to God that I give you something that, that is a pivotal thing in your life that that um, that takes this church higher because I there's I'm telling you guys I, I've been I've been in a lot I'm not uh, I've been in a lot of churches but I don't see this very often amen. that that's where you say amen you guys this amen. I don't see this very in, in many of the places I go and when I do see it I get very very excited because I, I, I know that God is about to do something amazing. He's already done something, but guys, I know it's hard for you to imagine, but you might be just getting started. Amen. 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 I got to say this. We're going to go to Numbers chapter 35, but I got to say this because it keeps tormenting my mind. And so maybe it's useful to somebody. But for days now, I've been thinking about how cell towers work when you, you know, isn't it great to have a cell phone nowadays, you guys? And, uh, and, you know, (laughs) know, I I thought of something, but I won't say it. (laughs) But, but, uh, you know, you, you know, they say a cell tower roughly is about 11 mile stretch. And so while you're going down the freeway, you're talking on the phone and it switches from cell tower to cell tower. You never know it. I, I, I remember I got off the plane in, in Kamchatka, Russia, standing out in a gravel parking lot. My sister from California called me. And how many know God knows right where you're at? <laughs> Amen. He's tracking you. I hope you're tracking him. But the handoff is what's fascinating me is that I can get on a plane, go all the way across the ocean, and and I'll be, my call, my number, my location will be handed off. 
And, and, and you say, well, what, what is the application here? You know, house of the Lord, you're a, you're a cell tower. And, 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 and God sends people through your domain for you to influence, and for you to reach. And guess what? They don't all have it together. Some of them are busted up, broken up, confused, lost. Amen. And, and so as they come into the sphere of house of the Lord, we want to make sure that what God intended for them takes place while they're passing through your influence. Amen. So I had to get that off of my mind. How many know that the, the word of God says that the name of the Lord is a high tower that the righteous run into it and they are safe. And the, the church is God's um, place of refuge. And so what we're going to do, I, 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 in, in, in Numbers chapter 35 and verse 12, you, you have to, you realize everything in the Old, Old Testament is there, put there for a reason. And so the, the Lord is giving them instruction. He said, there shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger. The Bible says in Romans it says that the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that sin, when it is, well, lust, when it is finished, brings forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Uh, it's very clear that those who pursue a, a, a life of, of separation from God, are ex they're exposed to danger by the avenger. Can you say amen? And so it says, that, but uh, the cities of refuge are there for, for, for them from the avenger that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And of the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. And so three of them will be one on one side in Canaan land and three of them will be on the other side of the Jordan. And, and so there are three, there are six cities of refuge that, that uh, uh, and here's the way this works. It, it, what do you say in here in the Old Testament, which is a type of the New Testament church? He's saying that uh, things happen in life. And if somebody accidentally should cause uh, another person to die, not on purpose, not murder, but, you know, it even later uses the example of the axe head flies off the handle, accidentally kills somebody. In their law, relatives could go and they could punt, they could take their life, an eye for an eye, you know, so on and so forth, you know. So you killed my brother, so I get to kill you, and they're, they're not uh, uh, judged for that. It's, their, it's, their, uh, it's the law, and it's their right. If you took my brother's life, I can take your life, and, and every, everything's cool. However, what do you do when someone takes a life by accident? They, the Lord said, I'm going to give you places where you can go and hide from the avenger. And I won't get into all of the legalistic part of it, but what's important to recognize today is that in the Old Testament, God said, I want you to build six cities of refuge where people can run into. I believe that that is a type of the church. How many know in, in, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Come on, say amen with me. I'm, I'm getting nervous here, all right? <laughs> but, you know, it's important. We are co-workers with the Lord, right? We're partners, right? He won't do it without us. We can't do it without him, right? And so we're doing this together, and we are caught up in this enterprise. Now, let me give you just a kind of a secular definition of enterprise. It means a project or undertaking that, undertaking that is especially difficult, I can say amen to that. 40 years of pastoring, sometimes it gets a little rough. Amen? It's not always easy, not always a bed of roses. And it, sometimes it's complicated or risky. And, and this is a second definition. It is a purposeful activity, usually with a challenge to it. You and I are involved in God's purpose or activity that is significant, but sometimes it comes with a challenge. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Don. That was good. Okay, so the church is God's idea, and you and I are a component in that. This enterprise called the church has been given a mission. I can see, you know, as soon as I come in here, I feel like I'm at home, and that's the way it should be. 
So really, I'm done. Let's close up and we can all go to the restaurant right now because you already, you're already. The, but the mission is helping people uh, uh, find Jesus. Amen. The great, uh, great commission, right? The mission is to help people find Jesus. Our mission is also to help people, get this, if you're taking notes, to help people survive earth. I don't know if you figured it out, but sometimes earth can bite you in the Ramakama shape. <laughs> right? Sometimes earth can be harsh to us. It's, it's not easy, and our mission is also helping people. It's great. Uh, you, if you're going to go to heaven, you got to survive earth to get there. Yeah. It's kind of like you get saved. It's like taking off in the airplane. But, but how many know that you don't, you don't want to fly with a pilot that only took lessons on how to take off? <laughs> you know, oh, you know, he said, I got this, and he skipped the last five classes. And he said, oh, you know, I just realized I got to land this thing too. How many know we got to help people survive earth? And that's part of the enterprise of the church. Yes, we're trying to get them to heaven with us. And so the process of helping people find Jesus, the process of surviving earth, and the process of making heaven, there is a need for a place, a mission, which is our mission, called the church, the ecclesia, or the ecclesia, ever how you want to say it. And, and so you and I are in, we are involved in the greatest enterprise in the universe. We didn't just stumble in here because we liked somebody and we wanted to see them today. You know, if you read Isaiah 49, it, it, it says that he knew my name before I was even born. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. He has made me like a polished arrow. And in his quiver has he hid me. How many know we're all in process? God is... God is getting us ready at any moment to, to use us like arrows to the enemy. Amen. Amen? And, 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 and so you might think that you're on automatic pilot, but you're not. God is direct. Even in Corinthians, it says that he sets, it says he places us in the body as he sees fit. And so here we are now, all of us today in this uh, cell, cell site within range. This is our sphere of influence. We are a component of the bigger church. And, and as people pass through our region, we have a mission. And our mission is to be a city of refuge. Our mission is to be a place where the person, you see, uh, a lot of people that are in sin are trapped in that sin. Amen. Uh, you know, I was, I grew up in old Pentecost and uh, we grew up to not only hate sin, but we hated the sinner too. And we never could understand why they wouldn't come to church. <laughs> Just kind of bogged his mind, you know, but the church is, is here to rescue people from the Avenger. Like these cities of refuge, we are a place that they can run into and find, find how many know this is, the church is not a youth camp for fellowship. It is a base camp to get the job done. Come on. And, and so I, I've been fascinated since now that I'm off of, uh, and I'm not pastoring any longer. You know, when you're pastoring, Sunday's coming. And, 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 and I don't know if you know what that means, but uh, when you're pastoring, Pastor Jeff, y'all don't say amen because they really think you're a hero here. When, but when you're pastoring, you're on a hamster wheel. And you can't get off. It's like, you know. Uh, the, well, I'm going to tell you something about this enterprise, okay? More people are in church this Sunday morning that, uh, across America than, than will attend all of the major sports activity, uh, sports games in, for the entire season. Listen, I'm going to give you some numbers here. I, and I, they're as new or recent numbers as what I could find. But listen to this. Today, this day, 120 million people will attend church this morning. Think about that. Now listen, hang on. You can clap anytime for me. I'm, I'm you know, I'm humble. But, but, but all of the sports events combined for the entire season doesn't equal one Sunday morning in the house of the Lord. Can you, how many know this is a big enterprise? 
So I did a little research, and this was last year, so I don't know if it's changed much. But in the NFL, 1.1 million people will attend uh, during the season. For uh, 45 million people will attend a Major League Baseball game. Uh, they did last year anyway. 22 million tickets were sold last year for the NBA. 220,000 people will attend a NASCAR race, which is the only excuse for skipping church is the NASCAR race. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but if you add them all up for the entire year, they will not, th there will still be more folks in church today than all of those put together. How many know we're involved in something big? Yeah. We're a part of something big. Now here's the bad news. The bad news, the number is declining a little bit. So that means we got to get off of our something and get busy. Amen? Amen. I've been thinking, and, and uh, I put this together in Tennessee, and then I come out here to Old Town. How many people live in Old Town, Idaho? How, how many? What's the population here? Huh? Well, I got I to gotta be honest. You know, pastors are good people, but they will lie. And when me and Pastor Jeff are on the phone, I'm in Tennessee, he's out here, he's telling me what God's doing right here, and I'm like, yeah, he's counting every squirrel, every chipmunk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but now that I'm here, and so I put this, what I'm about to share with you together, and, and now that I'm here, I was like, I want to fold up and go home, but, but you, you got most of this, and maybe some of this will help you. I'm thinking like, what if, in this enterprise that we're involved in, what if... What if every time someone walks through the doors, we greeted them with welcome home? You guys are already doing that. But I promise you, I've been, I went, I've been in the first church of the Frigidaire way too many times. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's, there, there, there's some people, they don't have uh, greeters, they have bouncers at the door. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, anyway. What if, though, what if we said, welcome home and meant it, and we meant it? It's part of our mission, you guys. And what if we rolled out the red carpet for every person, regardless of who they are? What if church was fun? I got a feeling it is here. <laughs> but what if church was fun? What if church was enjoyed, not endured? <laughs> Have you ever been in a service where you're like, uh, you, want, you, you felt like grabbing a placard and going outside, free the hostages, free the hostages, you know, get them out of here. <laughs> I've been in sermons that was that long and they marched on me. That's where I got that. Okay. So, but, um, but what if church was enjoyed rather than endured? And what if we focused on connecting people instead of correcting people? And I know y'all got this, but you're only an eight, and we're working on getting you up to a 10, okay? <laughs> oh, I just got dismissed right there. <laughs> what if instead of fixing people, we just focused on getting them to Jesus, to just help, help them find Jesus? You know, um, my parents weren't highly educated. They loved the Lord with a passion. We traveled all over America doing uh, uh, revivals, and I grew up in the back seat of a 55 Buick, literally. Um, uh, I've lived in, I lived in 24, I lived in 80 some houses before I was 16. We spent the, that's why I ain't educated, y'all. You can't get an education if you're traveling all the time. But, and, and they made a lot of mistakes. They didn't have a lot of training, but... One thing they instilled in me was a passion to give God everything. Not just be a Sunday go to meeting guy, but just an all in, just let him have everything you got. Whatever you got, give it to him and watch what he will do with it. And, and, and I, my, I can remember, you know, we grew up very poor. <laughs> Y'all supposed to go, oh, oh. We grew up really, really poor. And, and, and you know, we didn't, and I could, I could spend the rest of the day on that. But I won't. Uh, but one of the, one of the th even though we grew up poor, one of the things I got as a, as, a, a, as a son growing up in ministry was that there is a God in heaven that if you call on him, he'll change your life. And regardless of, you know, see, we took this away from the inner city kids. 
They're telling them there's no God and that they're trapped in a concrete jungle. And of course you're a victim. But listen, it doesn't matter where you are. If we can bring them to Jesus and if we can get them to understand that there is a God in heaven who hears and answers prayer. And I'm going to tell you, as a kid growing up, I was in places where nothing could help me but a supernatural father who cared about where I was. And he was the pathway out of the woods for me. And if we could just get them to Jesus. So what if instead of trying to fix everybody, we just focus them on discovering that there's a father who wraps his arms around you. And yes, you were a victim. Yes, you were a sinner. And yes, you had uh, things in your life that need to be cleaned up. But if you'll just fall on the rock, and instead of letting the rock fall on you, he will change your destiny. I can speak that with authority, you guys. So what if we were a hospital instead of a uh, judgmental? What if we treated guests at our church the way we treat guests in our home? What if we genuinely like this one? What if we genuinely loved people? And we do. I know you do. I sense it. I've already experienced it. What if we were actually nice? (laughs) You guys. (laughs) I preached in a church one time. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to be nice, okay? I preached in a church one time that the, it had about 18 rows of, of, of seats. And, and no one sat in any of the first 10 rows. All the way back. Now, you see, I don't see very good. I'm blind in one eye. And, and, and I'm, look, I'm trying to see. There are people in here, aren't they? All of them were all the way back there in the back. And they didn't greet me coming in. I was the speaker. The pastor was on vacation or something. By the way, they didn't give me an offering either. (laughs) Not that you have to do that, Brother Jeff. But if... (laughs) Oh, I wrote this down. What if you gave the new pastor visiting a really big offering? I forgot about it. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I would do this for nothing. And hoping to God I don't have to. (laughs) But what if we... And, and all, all the back three rows were full of people, and all the rest of the rows were empty. And it, it was just, it was just, it was just, uh, it, it was just sad. And, and uh, I, I prayed to God that that pastor would never ask me to come and fill his pulpit again. But if we, what if we genuinely loved people? We'd want to be on the front row, amen? Now, I got to tell you guys, when church started today, the front rows were almost empty. And a thought crossed my mind, instead of building a bigger sanctuary, let's just create 12 front rows. They'll all be empty and y'all, can, y'all have room for more people. What if we were like that uh, sitcom Cheers? You know, where everybody knows your name. God help us if the Saturday night visit to some club in town is more welcoming than the house of God on Sunday morning. Come on, you guys. The club on Saturday night must never show more friendliness than the church does. We're involved in a great enterprise. Can I tell you something? There is nothing more exciting than being used of God. Uh, Yeah, that's another place where you do the whole... I know you're deeply in thought right now about that. There's nothing more exciting than being used of God to accomplish this mission. Now, I'm impressed with the, uh, the number of people that are in this house attending the house of the Lord, especially versus how many are out in the community. But how many would agree with me that there's still a lot of people out there that they haven't found him yet? They haven't found him yet. And they, they, the devil has convinced them that church ain't for them and all of that. But this enterprise calls this church has its mission. This church, the enterprise called the church also has its method. The church is not a youth camp. It's a base camp. Y'all have base camps up here when they have forest fires, right? And you stage everything there and then you go out and get to put the fires out, right? Isn't that how it works? And the Lord has made us a base camp. We are a city of refuge. We are a place that, the, that people can come to and, and, and escape the avenger. The, what I mean by the avenger is the consequences of the bad choices that they've made in their past. Yeah, the wages of sin is death, but guess what? I found a cross in your house. Can I stop for a minute? I heard the blood song today. I heard the, I see the cross on. You know that across the country, a lot of churches 
feel like they can't show a cross that that you know we got to be relative to, to the culture and they won't sing about the blood because the unsaved don't listen they need to hear about the blood of Jesus and they need to know what took place at the cross so this is a base camp and our method is to love God and to love people one of the problems with loving God and loving people is we don't know what love looks like Jesus said, my commandment is that you love one another even as I have loved you. In the same fashion that Jesus, Ephesians 5 says that Jesus loved the church so much he gave his life for it. This is an enterprise that God cares about. This thing called the church, the city of refuge. So when it comes to loving, God help us to learn how to love like Jesus did. How many right now would say, Lord, give me the heart of Jesus Give me the heart of Jesus. I learned something early on, guys. When somebody says love, uh, 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 if five people hear it, there'll be five interpretations of what they said. How many know you can love a Whopper with cheese or you can love your wife? And hopefully not, the, not, the, not on the same level, all right? <laughs> but, so, so, but give me the, I want the Jesus kind of love. To love, to love God and to love people. And we're, we're told to illuminate the pathway out of the woods. You are the light of the world. We're the pathway. I, I read this story. I'm, I'm not an artist. I can't even draw a straight line. But I, I was told that when they draw, draw a wooded scene that they never, they always put a path or a trail or a road, a dirt road through the scene. And the reason is psychologically when someone looks at a picture of, of nature of the woods, psychologically there's something in them that wants to know well how do I get out of the woods can I tell you something there's a lot of people out there even right now as we're enjoying this house that are asking the God they don't know how can I find the pathway out of the woods and when Jesus said you are the light of the world guess what he was saying you take them the path let them find the road through you uh, how to get their life out of the woods and into the city of refuge the sinner is not our enemy. He is our, he's caught in a snare. He's like a rabbit. When I was a kid, I used to catch birds. You know, anybody ever do this? You know, put a cardboard box and a stick. And a, anybody ever do that? How, how many know that nobody ever did? I thought I was in the country here. When, when, I, when I was growing up, we set a cardboard box and a stick and a little string, you know, and put some seeds or something in there. And when that little bird just kind of went after the seeds, we'd pull that string and we got our bird. Anybody ever do that? No? We didn't do it in L.A. <laughs> uh, and when you think of people that are caught in their sin, yes, of course, they, uh, they're a little bit uh, rough. Because, they're, you know, the very nature of a snare is that it's sprung before you know it exists. Think about that for a minute. And Satan's been around a long time to design snares. But I'm going to leave you with this thought. Around the world, there's 163 United States embassies. Deb and I have been in about 30 countries. Been locked up. In <laughs> been lost in a lot of countries. And been locked up in one or two. But there is a, uh, when there is a U.S. embassy in that country and you get in trouble, all you got to do is make your way to that embassy. When you get to the embassy, it could be 10 acres in the middle of Kamchatka, Russia. But that's United States territory and you are a citizen of the United States and all of the rights that you have in America are right there in that embassy and the avenger out there in the whatever country you're in cannot touch you because you went into the cover of the United States embassy. How many get the drift here? You tracking with me? This enterprise called the church also has, it has its mission and has its methods and it has its means y'all ready everybody say get ready now here here comes the hard hard part and i'm going to share this because when i when i got the tour here a, a day or two ago i got so excited because i can see i can see what's going on here maybe you maybe i'm sure you do too but something big is about to happen it's already happening it, you don't accidentally get a church given to you right 
They never gave me one in L.A. I could... <laughs> but this, here's the hard part. As we, as we, as we, we don't believe that if you build it, they will come. I'm looking, or there's going to be another service a little later here. This one's already full. And, and uh, we don't believe that if you build a big building, people are going to come and fill it up. No. But I will tell you from experience, we, let me tell you, we're, our church, before we built a new campus, we had to park people at the high school and have a shuttle bus. For three years, you had to get on a bus to ride over to our church. And when church was over, you had to line up to take you back to your car over at the high school. That's a, called a slow growth initiative, by the way, is what that is. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Lord, for the miracles that we saw. But, but uh, so if, I'm not, I don't know, I, Pastor Jeff has not told me anything like this. But if you need to expand this building, or if you need to build another one, guess what? God doesn't go poof, there it is. That's, you say amen right there. Amen. Because he has signed us up to be a part of the enterprise. He won't do it without us. We can't do it without him. You see, in communism, everything belongs to the state. In capitalism, everything that you can righteously acquire, legally righteously acquire, belongs to you. But guess what, you guys? We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And in the scripture, in the kingdom, in Christianity, it all belongs to God. Now it's going to get really, really quiet. That's why I didn't tell you why I was going to preach, Brother Jeff, okay? Is that everything in Christianity that I have belongs to him. Amen. We had to do an $11 million transition with just a small, I mean, about like your church. And that was very scary. But how many know God is able? And he did it, and today it's just an amazing thing to look back at. But I learned something about this whole giving thing. In the scripture, y'all know, I don't even have to go to this. I mean, remember the parable Jesus gave. It's found in Luke 12, if you're taking notes. Uh, about the man, and it's interesting, I went there early this morning and circled all the personal pronouns of this man, but he said his crops came in really big and full. And he said, what am I going to do? I'll tear down my barns, build bigger barns, and I'm going to take my ease, and I'm just going to enjoy my stuff. And he just kept saying, mine, mine, it's all mine, it's all mine. But how many know it's not ours, it's his. It belongs to him. And so this is a man who did very little in his life with much that he had within his reach. Now let's go to the next one. And I'm almost done. And the next one is that here's a, is the, remember the, the, the Lord went and he gave one guy one talent, one guy two talents, one guy five talents. How many remember this? And then he comes back and he said, well, how are we doing? And the guy with one talent said, man, I buried it. Here is what you gave me. I'm not giving you anything more, anything less. He didn't steal it. He didn't consume it. He didn't lose it. He didn't use it. All he did is he did nothing with what God had given him. And, and as far as I can tell in the New Testament, this is the harshest that the Lord ever spoke to someone other than to the Pharisees. And he said, take what he does have and give it to him that has. Because to him that has, more will be given. To him that has not, that which he does have will be taken away. And then take him and push him out into where there's uh, darkness, where there's weeping. That's pretty strong stuff, you guys. And all the guy did wrong was he just didn't do anything with the gift that God gave him. He did very little with a little. I'm almost done. Much with little. The sack lunch. They got to feed 5,000. What do we have? There's a little boy here. He's got a couple fishes, some loaves. Give it to me. I'll do the rest. It's little, but man, it fed. And then they took up enough baskets for each disciple to have their own sack lunch when it was finished. And this is an example of somebody that did a lot with very little. And then the last one is much with much. In Luke chapter 19, there's a fruitful servant. He's been given five talents, and he turns it into five more talents. And God celebrates him. And so, here's, here's where we're at with this. You can be the kind of person who does little with much. 
Or we can be the kind of person who does much with little. We can be the kind of person who does little with little. Or we can be the kind of person that does much with much. And I'd like for the worship team, if you would, to come. And we're going to wind this thing down here. But here, here's the way it works. We get to choose our model. We get to decide what our role in the enterprise of the, called the church is going to be. I, I know I think a little weird. I, I know my mind works different than a lot of people's. But the other day I was thinking, I wonder what kind of church Jesus would tithe to. Anybody ever thought about that? You know, Jesus comes, shows up in Idaho. I wonder what kind of church he would put his resources in. I believe we have one right here. Sometimes I think about, well, let me put it another way. When the Brownsville revival was going on, I had, a, a, I had opportunity to go there, be on the platform and watch this thing. And I learned that people from all over the world were coming and getting saved and stuff. But the people who had been part of that church before the revival could, couldn't even get in. And it caused, I went away thinking, I wonder if I would tithe to a church where I couldn't have a seat in that church. I don't know. I've never been in that position. But I do know this, just from what I'm seeing, smelling, hearing, feeling, is that God is doing something so big here. Whatever you're thinking, it's much bigger than that. Why don't you just lean to your neighbor right now and say, whatever you're thinking, God thinking something bigger. I'm serious, you guys. Bigger than I can conjure up. Bigger than Pastor Jeff. Bigger than any of us because God is a big God. There's still a lot of need for people to be born again and find Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, would you stand with me for a minute? I'm going to ask you. Are you going to be the kind of person that does little with little? You're going to be the one that does little with a lot. Maybe God's blessed you, but you haven't yet chosen to be generous. Are you going to be the kind of person that will do much with much? God uses people all across the land. We never forget that in order to treasure in heaven, we have to give up treasure on earth. I don't know how I'm doing with time, but I got to tell you, there is a passage in John, I think it's chapter 15, where Jesus says that if you'll sign up with me, he talks about uh, uh, the pain of being in ministry. There is agony. Progress comes packaged in pain. We birth. We literally birth in the spirit realm, this enterprise called the church. But then, and he says, so to the disciples, he said, the world's going to rejoice. You're going to lament. You're going to be like a woman having a baby. But he says, after she's had the baby, she forgets the pain for the joy of bringing a man child into the world. And he says, I'm going to give you a joy that no man can take away. Now here, here it is. I'm 69 years old, you guys. I gave my whole life to building one church and no one can take that away from me. It's a joy. I've had Mercedes and motorcycles and whatever, but no one can take this joy away from me because I allowed God to do much with little. And so I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your head and say, Lord, who am I today? Who do I want to be? Maybe he's given you a lot and you've done little with it, but today you're making a change and I'm gonna do much with much. Maybe you feel like, man, I don't have much. Listen, the widow's might was amazing because it was all she had. It was much with little. The little boy's sack lunch, much with little. Perfect examples. So you get to decide today. I don't have a lot, but Lord, I wanna do a lot with it. Or I have a lot, but I don't wanna do anything with it. Or Lord, I have a lot, but I wanna do a lot with it. And I believe that Jesus sees our heart. He said, he, he's, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. 
and then he signs you and I up for the ride to be partners. Father God, if there's anyone in this room today, keep your hands bowed for a moment. If there's anyone in this room that maybe you've never asked the Lord into your life, could you just raise your hand? If you're ready today, say, Pastor Don, I want to I want to I want to sign up. I want to be a part of the family of God. Maybe you're here today and you say, I feel enough, I've heard enough, I sense enough. I want to get on board with where God's taking the human race. Let me see your hand. I don't I can't see that well, but I'm gonna I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, okay? Can we do this? If you don't mind, it'll be short. Just repeat this after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner and that I need God in my life. So I ask you to come into my life and set up your kingdom within me. I ask you to give me the power to live a Christian life. And I lean on you for forgiveness for all of my sins, past, present, and future. In Jesus' name. If you're praying that prayer today, maybe first time or first time in a long time, make sure you stop and talk to somebody on the way out and let us know. And now I want to pray with you that the Lord will seal in your heart. Watch, watch your model. Father, we feel your presence in this room, and we know that there's something coming down the road. And you're just structuring, just putting things in place. And I'm asking shadows and use them in a mighty way. Use their gifts, use their time, use their talents. Use all of our resources in this enterprise called the church. In Jesus' name, thank you guys. God bless you.